I want to read to you from 1 John chapter 1, the first four verses. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Would you pray with me? Lord, speak from your word this morning. Lord, we want to hear not from your preacher, but from your word. And we want to hear not by my words, but by your spirit. Lord, we just uh, pray that you would open our hearts and minds and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I do want to uh, say Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I didn't really give you timing there, did I? Happy New Year! Uh, There are a few of you at home I couldn't quite hear. One more time. Happy New Year. Year. All right. Okay, so we are going to be studying through the book of 1 John. Now, for some of you, you're like, hey, that sounds exciting. I like that book. Some of you are like, where is that book? I'm not even exactly sure. And maybe you're sitting out there and you're going, I'm not really that familiar with the Bible. Why would I care about reading this little book? It's only, uh, let's see, in Mark's Bible, it's about four pages long. I mean, why bother to spend quite a bit of time? Well, there's three things that I'm praying that we will get out of this as we dig into 1 John over the next few months. We're calling this service, this, this series, Prove It. Now, as soon as I say prove it, I've begun to realize that there are a lot of people that think, oh, this is like apologetics. It's like how you can prove that, you know, the Bible is true, how you can prove the truth of the gospel. That's really not the kind of proving it we're talking about. Because that's really not the kind of proving it that the Bible talks about. There are three things that I'm praying you will get out of this. Number one, and this is probably primary, I'm praying that you will come out of this series knowing that you have eternal life. In fact, if you flip ahead in your Bibles to 1 John 5, John stops and he says, I want to tell you why I've written this book. And he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. That's why he wrote it, was so we would know that we could know that we know that we have eternal life. Now, there's two sides to this, because there's confidence in death that says, hey, I have eternal life. I can come to the end of this life and be okay. But there's also a confidence in life, because if you spend your life afraid that you might do something wrong, how good is that? I mean... When I was in youth ministry, every year there would be students who were like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to go to college, and I'm afraid I'll make the wrong choice. And so they were terrified, and, and we can be frozen by indecision. And the reality is, is that God intends us to have a comfort that knows, hey, I have eternal life in Christ. I'm fine. And the reality is, if you're ever thinking about, like, should I take this job? Should I move? Should I go to this college or this college or this college? We need to have this freedom that comes from the fact that we belong to Jesus. And you know what? Usually God says things like, you know what, I'm not really that concerned whether you go to this college or this college. I'm more concerned on how you're going to live and who you're going to be once you get there. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray and ask for God's guidance. I'm saying that when we have confidence that we can live life not afraid to take the next step. But the other thing that I, I think John wants us to know as you read this book is He also wants us to stop and say, should I know that I have eternal life? In other words, he kind of says some things in this book that will make you go, oh, 
well, do I? Several times in the book of 1 John, he says things like 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. He says this, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. So it sounds like he's saying, I'm writing this so that you will know you don't have eternal life. It's kind of what it feels like, isn't it? But what he's saying is, I want you to have eternal life, and I want you to know that you have eternal life. But he's also saying, I don't want you to think you have it when you don't. You know, aren't there times in our lives when we think we've got something figured out, and then we figure, we realize we're entirely wrong? Like for some of you, that might have been the entire time you were in a math class in high school, right? Right? You'd, you'd be studying, you know, trigonometry and you're trying to figure this stuff out and you're going, ah, the tangent of the blah, blah, blah. That's the way calculus was for me. I actually went to college and I was a math minor. I, I had three semesters of calculus and then I went on to other classes beyond calculus, which by the way, there should not be any classes beyond calculus. It's just wrong. But, um, the reality is there were so many times that you think you've got to figure it out and then you do the problem and you're completely wrong. So there is a question of, do I have eternal life? He wants us to ask that question so we can answer it. It's kind of like if you've ever done a trust fall. A trust fall is when, um, I didn't bring my water up with me, did I? Um, a trust fall is when you have a situation where one person stands behind you and you fall into their arms. Well, one of the recurring themes that you'll see in situation comedies occasionally is somebody doing a trust fall and the other person walks away at the wrong moment and they just fall. And the reality is we want to make sure that the things we're falling on are the right thing. So that's the first thing. I'm praying that you will know you have eternal life. Secondly, now Sid's going to walk over here and get me my water. And that's just too kind. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's not much. It's okay. The second thing that I'm praying that we will get out of this book is that um, you will know God's love. Not know about God's love. In this book, over and over again, it seems to say that we're supposed to know and experience God's love. In fact, in 1 John 4, verse 8, John gets so, so committed to the idea of love that he says straight up, God is love. And one of the things that I'm praying as we study through this book is, is that you will come out of this feeling like you have a bigger picture and a bigger experience and a bigger understanding of how big God's love is. Now, you may have been in church your whole life and you're going, I already know that. Really? I promise you that what you know of God's love is just a taste of how big it really is. No matter how much you think he loves you, he loves you more than that. No matter how much you think you can know his love and experience and, and know that in your life, it is bigger than that. In fact, it's interesting that John writes this because John was a close friend of Jesus. He wasn't just somebody that watched from a distance. He knew about love. And he walked with this guy, Jesus, for a long time. And he knew what love looked like. So number one, I'm praying that you will know you have eternal life. Number two, I'm praying that you will know God's love. Number three, I am praying that you will live out God's love. Over and over again in this book, John writes and says, Look, God loves you. Love other people. God has done this for you in Christ. Do that for other people. Over and over and over again, he says, how can you say that you love others, that, that you love God, when you don't love your brother? How can you say that, oh, I am overwhelmed by the love of God, but I hate that person? So that's the third thing. And that's not just a, an I thing. It's not just, oh, oh, I'm praying that I will live out God's love or that you will live out God's love. It's a matter of saying, let's do that together as a church, 
as the people of God, as the church of God universal, let's love better. Can you imagine how easy it would be? Now, some people would still be closed, but can you imagine how easy it would be to tell people about Jesus if we loved like Jesus? If the, if, if the people that claim the name of Jesus and are Christians, if we really loved sacrificially and passionately and intentionally, if we loved the way Jesus did, can you imagine how blown away people would be? I mean, think in your own life. Most of us can probably think of somebody that we're like, wow, that person is really loving. That person really cares about the people around them. Or maybe more specifically, you think, that person really loved me when I needed to be loved. And so maybe you have that picture of, in your mind of that person. Well, here's the key, the key. Jesus loves more than that. Imagine if we were all like Jesus in that way. Now, just so you understand, when 1 John talks about love, it more talks about actions more than like mushy emotion stuff. I mean, there's a feeling involved, but it's about actions. I got a text from Julie this morning, uh, a little after nine o'clock says, well, several texts. First text said, I'm on my way. Second text said, NVM, which is never mind if you're not like, you know, the text savvy. Um, I, she slid off the driveway and then she said, oh, I'm on my way. Third text. The neighbor saw me and came out and helped push me out and get me started. What if we are the people that do the things that people need? Now, some of you are like, my back can't push people out of, yeah, you know, don't push a car if your back won't push a car. But you can find a way to love people. So that's what 1 John is about. Now, we're just going to look at the first four verses, which will be a relief to somebody, some of you, because you're like, it's already 20 after. Um, but here's, here's the key, the foundation as we look at this book. See, John is writing to the people around Ephesus. You'll notice if you read your Bible much that um, Paul very often starts these books he writes to a church. He says, to the church of God in Ephesus, to the church in Corinth. And he's writing to a very specific group. But in this case, we don't really know who he's writing to. Most scholars believe that he's writing to the Christians in the area around Ephesus. He had been there. He had lived there. He had been their pastor. He cared about them. And he's writing them. Um, this is almost like a pamphlet. He's like saying, okay, here this is, pass it around, share it with other people. And let's look at what he says. First of all, he said, first thing I want you to notice in verse one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. What he's starting out saying is, I want you to understand that our faith is not just in our heads. It's not just a philosophy of life. It's not just a way of thinking about things. A lot of people, it's interesting. Have you noticed that people will say, well, I'm not a Christian, but I'm very spiritual. And if you ask them what that means, usually that means, well, sometimes that means nothing at all. <laughs> but sometimes it just means, well, I, I just think about concepts a lot. And, and what John is saying right here is that our faith is not just context. It's not just concepts. He, he roots it in history. He says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, you know, the things that we have actually heard, not just thought of in our own minds, the things we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at. Now, you might say, well, that's redundant. That which we've seen and we've looked at. Different word there. Seen means something that came into our view, basically. Looked at means, and we stopped and we looked at it. Like some of you, when you go to the grocery store and you're going to buy like a cantaloupe, you know, you, you might walk by the cantaloupe. You've seen them. Oh, there they are. 
But then there are some of you, and I don't want to shop right after you, because you're like, I'm going to look at it. And you get it, and you're smelling it. And, you know, sometimes Julie has tried to teach me how to, how to check out a good, water, uh, good cantaloupe. I don't get it. She says, smell this one. It smells like cantaloupe. Okay, now smell this one. It smells the same. Anybody else been there? Or, or you're getting a watermelon, you're thumping it, you're looking at it. You're saying, I want to find the right one. I've done more than just kind of have a passing acquaintance. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, you know what? We're telling you what we've heard of, what we've seen, and what we've really examined. That which we have looked at in depth and our hands have touched. Now, the reason that's important is that um, John was writing this in the area around Ephesus. There was a growth of what was called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, basically, to oversimplify, said that, that physical stuff is bad, the spiritual stuff is good. And they really, um, it was increasingly popular, and there was a couple problems. One problem was that people would say, well, flesh doesn't matter. So how I live my life and what I do doesn't really matter because that's not spiritual. And the other thing was that they began to say, well, Jesus wasn't really a man because God couldn't be flesh because flesh is bad. So he's writing a letter to help them to kind of understand that. And all the way through this book, you will find that John is constantly drawing connections between the spiritual, the mental, the thought stuff, the heart stuff, and the body stuff. He's saying you cannot disconnect those things. So he's saying this is the stuff that our hands have touched. We have done more than think about our faith. It has been reflected and it has shaped our lives and the things we do. You know, I... When I was little, most of you probably remember this song. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. And we'd say, oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down. Now, somehow in my mind, that always sounded like, for the Father up above is looking down. And he'll be really angry if you don't do No, no. He's looking down in love. He cares what we do with our hands. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say. And what we were saying was that our stuff that we do and how we live matters. And that's what John is saying. And then he says, and, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim. Now, it's interesting. In these verses here, he said, in verse 1, he says, proclaim. In verse 2, he says, we testify and we proclaim. Verse 3 says, we proclaim. And then in verse 4, he says, we write this. In other words, over and over again, he's saying, I, I want you to know this. I'm announcing it. It's not a secret. One of the things that stuns me is the number of people that say, well, I'm a Christian, but it's a private thing. Where I've, I've read this whole book, and maybe that's our quest. We're reading through uh, the Bible in 2021 to see so, so we can find the place where it says, don't talk about your faith it's a personal thing. Just a hint. It's not in there. Now there is a sense in which it's a personal thing. And it starts on the heart. But John is saying right away. We proclaim this. We announce it. It really, really matters. It's kind of like. Can you imagine Paul Revere. You know back in the. Independent, the war for independence. Paul Revere saying. The British might be coming. The British are possibly on their way, we're not really sure, to arms. No, the British are coming. He's proclaiming it. He's saying this is true. He is talking over and over again. Now, it's interesting as you look at verse 2. It's not clear that he's talking at first about a person, right? He's saying in verse 1, that which was we have heard, seen, looked at, our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it. Not him. 
but it. But as you go on, you realize that John does this over and over again. He does it in his gospel as well. He says, the word became flesh. What was the word? It was Jesus. In this case, he's also saying there's a connection between Jesus and eternal life. In fact, I, I don't think it's a stretch at all to say that as you look at these verses and the rest of the book, I will tell you, if you want to know that you have eternal life, Jesus is the answer, period. There isn't any other thing that you can have that's going to give you eternal life. <clears throat> In fact, if you're going to believe that something else can give you eternal life, then you have to eliminate Jesus because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we have to know this idea that all religions are the same can't be true. And I want to ask you, what are you trusting in? I mean, one of the things that's happened with the pandemic is that all of a sudden, I think most of us have had, whoa, death could happen a little more quick, quickly, right? I mean, I don't know if you heard about this. A congressman-elect from Louisiana, 41 years old, died of COVID. No pre-existing health conditions. I'm not saying that to scare you. But the reality is we need to ask ourselves, what are you trusting in? And why are you trusting in that? You know, some people will say, well, I, I, I trust, I, I believe in reincarnation and, and I believe in karma and, and I trust this. And, and if you ask them why, they're like, well, it just, it just seems right to me. I remember hearing an evangelist talk about this once. He said, okay, you have a, you have a choice. You can trust yourself. Anybody here ever make a mistake? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, so you're a known mistake maker. You're going to trust a known mistake maker, or are you going to trust the God of the universe who had all these hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that came true in Christ, and we're like, wow, he is not a known mistake maker. God doesn't make mistakes. Who are you going to trust? You're going to trust your own like, oh, that seems like a good idea. It feels right to me. Or are you going to trust the word? That's why we're reading through the Bible. Because we want a faith built on something real. That's why I'm encouraging you to memorize scripture. Now, let's be honest. Some of us are like, oh, I can't memorize anything. Okay. Important exercise, whether you're in the sanctuary or you're at home. Even if you're in the balcony. Um, I, I want you to repeat after me. If we confess. Okay, you've all just proven you can memorize this. Because this verse that we're going to memorize for the next week is 21 words long. Which means three words a day. Okay? I think you can do three words a day. What were the three words I just gave you? Well, see, you've already got it memorized. Uh, so, okay, I just want to encourage you to do that. And he says, this word that we're talking about, it's from the beginning. It was with the Father. And the thing that we have to remember over and over again is he overcame death in the grave. You might want to say, oh, I want to follow the philosophical teachings of Confucius. You know where Confucius is? He dead. I want to follow Buddha. You know where Buddha is? He's dead. Muhammad? He's dead. Jesus overcame death in the grave. He was crucified. He was buried. And he rose triumphant. And that's the one I want to trust. Because the biggest problem we're ever going to face in our lives. The biggest threat is death. And the gospel says. That's the one I want to trust. Because he died for me. He rose from the grave. So. Let's go on to verse 3. Why is he talking about this? Because up to this point, he's just saying, hey, this is what we're telling you. Why is he telling us? Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. That's interesting. He doesn't say, I'm writing this so you'll have eternal life. Although later that's going to become, that's going to become part of it. But he's saying, I want you to know this 
so we can have fellowship. Now, fellowship is a word we've watered down horribly in the church. (laughs) But in reality, he's talking about real connection. And we all want that, don't we? I mean, I remember doing some ministry in Cabrini Green housing projects um, before they tore them down on the uh, near west side of Chicago. And I would hear stories about fourth graders who would said, oh, you, you got to have a gang by the time you're in fourth grade because that's your family. We want to belong. Um, and, and it's amazing. Every time that we begin to share something in common, you know, one of the things that's true about me is anybody that has anything Iowa related, I automatically think you're like, well, you're probably a, a relative of some kind. But I, I feel a connection. I remember the first time before I was here, I was going to be a guest preacher. And I'm talking to Carl Faber on the phone. And Carl says, oh, my wife is from Oskaloosa, Iowa. And I'm like, my brother lives in Oskaloosa. And I'm, you know, right away. There's something about being connected and being part of something. And sometimes that includes our struggles. I don't know if I've mentioned this. I think I did a few weeks ago. Um, You know, Julie and I, when we first um, decided to have, we were ready to have children, it took us a little while. And I remember that feeling of, it's hard. And the people that would come up to us and say, yeah, we've been there. I could still name people from Grace Reformed Church who came up to us and said, I've been there. I've been there. And there's a connection of feeling like you have a commonality. It's more than just, oh, we had coffee together. In fact, if you look in Genesis chapter 4, it's interesting. Cain kills Abel, not in favor of killing your brothers. Bad choice. And God marks him. And you know what Cain is concerned about? He says, I will be a restless wanderer. Basically, he says... But now I won't have a place to belong. And what John is saying here is, we proclaim this so that you will have a place to belong. That we'll be connected. And so I want to encourage you and challenge you. Tell people about Jesus. And inside the church and outside the church, share your stories. Because have you ever heard somebody's story about how God has worked in their life and thought, well, I don't like that person anymore? No. Even if their story brings all kinds of struggle and all kinds of pain and all kinds of sin and failure, you say, okay, I get that now. We had a guy in our, uh, the first church where I did youth ministry. His name was Dave. And Dave was a, a youth volunteer. He helped with the youth group. And he was really good youth leader. He's a great guy. But he had a problem because anytime the, the high school students would say anything that kind of involved partying and kind of making some bad choices, he would get on this like very judgmental thing, you know, not just, a, a, oh, I don't know about it. He'd like get on this lecture thing. And the guys used to kind of say, they would say, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. That was like an ongoing comment for them. Thanks, Dave. Then one night at our youth meeting, Dave shared his story. And he talked about how he had been in his early 20s and he was at the bachelor party for his best friend. And I don't know the, I don't remember the details exactly, but it's something like this. We were driving on those curvy roads outside of town And we were kind of racing back in and we'd been drinking. And I I don't think we're really drunk, but we'd been drinking some. And and he was behind me. And all of a sudden I realized that my my friend wasn't behind me anymore. And so I turned around and I drove back and it was at night. And my headlights caught the glimpse of the car that had gone off the side of the road. And he said, I pulled over there. And as I was getting out of my car, my friend who was going to get married, 
my best friend from childhood. Car burst into flames and he was pinned in the, in the car. And he said, my friend died calling out to me saying, Dave. And all of a sudden the high school Zooms were like, okay, I get it. I know your story and now we're connected. That's where fellowship starts. Now, one thing I want to say related to that, I want to talk to you, those of you who are getting to around 60 or older. Um, you, you have seen and heard and looked at and touched more than the people who are younger. Okay? And in this next year of this church, we've talked about pivoting and moving to the future. We need you. Sometimes in the American church, we have kind of created this idea of, well, you kind of semi-retire from church. Now, I know some of you have put in a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of work, and I thank you for that. But we need, like I was talking about, we have the, the elders and the deacons that lead the church. We also have what's called the greater consistory or the great consistory. That's people who have been in those roles in the past and aren't actively serving. If you're an elder and you're not actively serving, I want to encourage you, be an elder. If you're a deacon, be a deacon. You don't even have to be in the office. The meetings aren't the fun part anyway. But, you know, elders are called to reach out to people and to love people, to nurture people, and to help people to grow. If you're an elder, keep doing that. We need that. Now, to those of you who aren't getting near to 60, um, we have another need. Um, yeah, some of us over the age of 50 aren't all that tech savvy. I'm not bad. Although, like I said, the website looks a little funky right now. Um, if you're a tech savvy person, and maybe that means you're 22, um, we, need, we need you too. We need you to help us to understand how we can communicate the gospel. We want you, we need you to, whether you're 20 or 15 or Hey, if you're a tech-savvy 70-year-old, I'll take you too. We need people to help us with Facebook. We need people to help us with our website. We need people to just love people. We need people to, sit, to come to church on Sunday morning saying, I'm going to love people today. I'm going to love people today. I'm going to love people today. Anyway, that's a side note. He's saying, we, we proclaim because we want you to have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with God. And so we all come together in Christ. We'll, we'll touch on some of this more next week. But verse 4 is interesting. He says, we write this to make our joy complete. Have you ever had the opportunity to see somebody you love Come to know Christ. Or maybe just somebody you know that has walked away and they turn around and they start coming closer to God again. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Some of you have people at home that you're praying for. Some of you have cousins or brothers or parents or children that you've been praying for. And you, you know what John means when he says, we write this to make our joy complete. You see, what he's saying is that ultimately, it's not about the church program. He's saying, it's about joy. It's about love. It's about the gospel. It's about a family that loves each other. It's about a Jesus who loved us so much that he gave his life on the cross and rose from the dead to give us life. And if we can experience that together, what kind of joy is that? I'm the transition pastor. Um, and there are some programs that 
we want to implement as part of the transition here. And some of them we haven't been able to implement as much as we'd like, partly because there are some things that I haven't done a very good job on. There are some things that have been really hard because of COVID. But the reality is, the key to transition is not the programs. You can have great programs. He is saying joy is in the gospel. The, the real key to change is the, in the word of God. It's in prayer. It's in people living out the love of God. And the key to our transition as individuals is not a program, a church. Like if you're saying, man, I, I need to be closer to God. I'm going to go to a different church. I have a bad news for you. That church will have just as many sinners, maybe even more than we have. It's about Jesus. It's about the gospel. And we write this to make our joy complete. Now, this is just the introduction to the book. Um, we're going to have a great time digging into this. I'm excited about it. It's going to be a great series of messages, I think, to invite friends to who maybe don't know Christ. Um, because we're going to talk about why we believe what we believe. And if you are... Um, if you're at home and, and you're like, uh, how can I do this? You can watch, you can organize a watch party, like, you know, link it to Facebook. And I don't even know exactly how a watch party works. But there's a way you can do it where you're watching a video and somebody else is watching a video. You're not even in the same building. But you talk and you watch it together. My kids watch movies with their friends who live multiple states away all the time now. I don't get that. But let's, let's invite people to know this Jesus. He was in the, with the Father in the beginning. He's with us now. And he's the source of eternal life. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the gospel. And we thank you so much for the church. We thank you for people who love each other. But Lord, we pray that you would make us more loving. We thank you for people who worship together. But we pray that you would make us better worshipers. We thank you for grace. And Lord, we pray that grace would make us more like you. We want to know you. We want to know that we know. And we want to share with others. In Jesus' name.